His name is John Ramirez. A retired CIA officer, John spent 25 years with the agency specializing in ballistic missile defense systems and signals analysis of weapon system radars. And along the way, he's learned some stuff that he now feels he wants to share with the world. And then we have what appears to be balls of energy. That's the best way I can describe it, that people have also seen. But he is no whistleblower. The information he's about to share comes after a CIA review of the information he wants to convey. And they gave their approval that John can talk about it all. This doesn't mean the CIA endorses his information, but rather, it was reviewed by the CIA to ensure no classified information is given to you or me. So what does he want to share that the CIA is okay with? Well, how about knowledge about a working group within the intelligence community studying orbs? Or how about the reality that internally CIA personnel within the agency talked about UFO-related events? And yes, so much more. I saw my orb. Stay tuned. You're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and taking this journey inside the Black Vault with me. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., and I've got a very special guest today, someone that I've wanted to talk to on this program for quite some time. He has uh, definitely popped onto the scene here and has done quite a few interviews and a very popular guest where he appears, uh, and rightfully so. He's got a lot of information to share. John Ramirez, John, thank you so much for uh, joining me on the program and, and taking a little bit of time with me and my audience. Well, John, thank you for having me. And um, so your audience might be interested to know a little backstory. Uh, when I was attending some of these UFO conferences with uh, a colleague of mine, uh, you were waiting to go on stage and we actually talked to you when you were like very young, many years yeah. ago. Uh, I believe it was a conference in Orange County, a UFO That's right. conference for Orange County. And uh, when you went up on stage to do your presentation, uh, he and I looked at each other, kind of smiled and said, you know, that guy really needs to talk to us. <laughs> And yeah. here I am talking to you. So I consider that as a circle that was closed. 360 degrees, we closed that circle uh, with my appearance uh, with you. Yeah, and I'm excited about it. I uh, was was surprised when you had reminded me because I remember, uh, I I if you recall where we were standing, if I was on stage, it was to the right before I went on. And right. when you guys had approached me and you had mentioned CIA, uh, I did. I hope I didn't show it to you, but I, I think I started sweating a little bit going, why are people from the CIA here, you know, waiting to watch me go up on stage? But I'm glad you reminded me. And that was quite a few years ago, like I said. And uh, it's great to have you on the program and be able to pick your brain now that you uh, have retired from your 25 year career in the CIA and have decided to come out and start talking openly about topics that. I would say not a whole lot of, of CIA uh, agents, personnel uh, like to talk about. And, and let me ask you, I wanted to ask you before the show, what is an accurate term for you? Were you an agent or were you a employee? What's, what's, what's proper? Well, we're, we're not agents. There are no agents in CIA. We hire agents. There are foreign nationals that for compensation, it could be monetary goods and services, they agree to spy against their own government because they have access into their own government and provide us with information. And so that is a major reason why there's so much secrecy. And a lot of our uh, most valuable intelligence sources are people who, if the information was known publicly and only like a very few people would have that information in his or her country, uh, their lives would be at stake. 
And so that's uh, a very precarious situation for them and for us because it exposes our sources. It may expose other sources if they interrogate this person. And also the method of extraction, met sources and methods, the method yeah. of extraction becomes very fragile. We won't be able to use that extraction method ever again. And so that's why a lot of the secrecy occurs. And so it's not like we're hiding information it's more like we need to protect these sources and methods because we may want to use the source again or other sources, and we need to protect how we get information out of that country, an adversarial country, to the United States. And so that's uh, that uh, type of person is an agent. I see. Uh, now, and, no, and how but, would you describe yourself? Uh, officers. Officers, got gotcha. Just officers, yeah. So operations officers, uh, analytic officers, uh, uh, science and technology officers. It could be logistics officers, you name it. I got gotcha. you. Uh, the full gamut of all of our uh, positions. We're just officers. So I want to talk a little bit, uh, just for a couple of minutes, about what you did for the CIA. I, I spoke a little bit about it in the introduction everybody just saw. But as I just mentioned, 25 years, uh, you were um, quite busy in, in, that, uh, in that time frame. Give me a nutshell version about those 25 years, if you can. Uh, and, and what did you do for the, for the CIA? Okay, so what I can talk about is uh, signals intelligence. Uh, everyone knows that the National Security Agency does signals intelligence. Um, they're the functional mission manager, the director of NSA, what we call DERNSA, is the functional mission manager for signals intelligence. CIA does um, human intelligence or human and uh, open source intelligence or OSINT. And so that's our, that's our focus. But within the CIA, uh, there are other capabilities uh, that are also capabilities in other agencies. But the focus of our capabilities is to support operations. So from a signals intelligence standpoint, our SIGINT officers deploy to protect operations. They may do counter surveillance. Uh, they may provide uh, gadgets uh, in order to do some of that extraction that I talked about that's highly sensitive. Um, so in my role, I did electronic intelligence. And electronic intelligence is the analysis of weapons related radar signals, missile seekers, uh, air defense radar systems associated with um, larger weapon systems. And so we would like collect signals and analyze them in a lab to get the internals of that signal. When I mean by internals, we want to reverse engineer that radar just based on the signals that we collect and any photographs may, we may have of the source, the radar antennas. For example, we can measure, combined with the signals, combined with other information provided by our overhead reconnaissance systems of how much power that we collected. And together, we can then model that radar system. And that information goes to a weapon systems analyst who's looking at, for example, if it's a surface to air missile system, uh, we might do the radar signals analysis for that system and they may do the interceptor, the actual shooting end of that weapon system, combining our data with the interceptor data, they'll have a better picture of that system. Now, DIA does the same thing. Uh, DIA has the Missile and Space Intelligence Center in Huntsville, Alabama. They also have a lab and they do the same thing. Uh, so what's the difference? Well, the DIA uh, is more interested in an adversarial system performance against what we have in inventory. So when we look at a system, we're looking at uh, the nuts and bolts and the internals of a system that is probably just being developed. So they don't have like hundreds of them scattered over a country They would have just like one or two that they're working on and they test. Uh, but DIA looks at the entire deployed system uh, what they call the electronic order of battle, all the emanations coming from deployed systems. And they model against what we're flying because they need to inform policymakers 
this adversary has a new surface air missile system and its performance is this. And we have, let's say the F2, F-22 or F-35 fighter planes. And we know the, the performance of those fighter planes and they have to model and simulate what our planes can do against that system or what that system can do against our planes. So the DIA does that type of, of work in great detail. And um, DIA reports, you know, you heard of DIRDS, there's just like a few yeah. pages. A DI, um, a Defense Intelligence Report from the DIA, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of pages. And that's one of the things that DIA doesn't like to release. And it's probably not foyable um, because it's extremely sensitive because it reveals our capabilities. Uh, it reveals those capabilities that we need to work on mm -hmm. in order to uh, counter a weapon system that's deployed. And what we provide is weapon systems that are going to be deployed so that they can queue up the acquisition side of the department saying, okay, this adversary has this weapon system. Uh, our, our counter to that isn't as good. We need to either improve that weapon system or build a new one. And so that's the relationship of what we do versus let's like NSA and DIA. But we do have a lab and um, surprisingly, every September is family day. So the family members who are uncleared, the children, um, close relatives um, of staff members and contractors invite their family members uncleared to tour the CIA. They practically have the full run of the house as long as they're escorted by a badged officer or a badged contractor. And so here's my top secret SCI lab. And I would giving tours of my lab uh, and putting up demonstrations, pumping in signals to simulate a radar system and just showing how we do things. So in a way it's highly secret, but in a way it's it's not. The fact yeah. of is not secret. So you you know, John, I, I could have happily have been your son that day <laughs> when we would go in there. And uh no, uh that's uh, fascinating. And and one of the other job titles that stuck out to me, which is uh, one thing I want to deal with before we we move on from your background, is that you were a founding member of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence's National Counterproliferation Center or NC. PC. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I believe that the history of that office began at CIA, then was moved. Is that that correct to ODNI? Well, it's one of the offices that reside both at CIA and at the ODNI level. At CIA, uh, it's the counterproliferation uh, division underneath uh, the Directorate of Operations. And in fact, uh, the most infamous member of that division, we all know, was Valerie Plain. She worked for CP. Mm -hmm. uh, I work for NCPC at the ODNI level, where we have counterproliferation efforts throughout the government. And we were coordinating the United States government's response to deter, uh, to uh, stop proliferation of nuclear materials. And we were making sure that at the policy, not the operational level, at the policy level, that we weren't doing things that were redundant, that we were like providing resources to them, be advocates for resources to these other CP organizations, such as at the FBI, NASA security branch, uh, there is a uh, CP division. And at NSA, uh, in a directorate called S director for SIGINT, and in a subdirectorate called S2, which is analysis and production, there is a uh, Office of Counterproliferation. So that's just two examples of other counterproliferation efforts. So you know, we want to make sure that we don't redundantly like uh, provide capabilities. Yeah. That when we build something for the CP equity, that everyone has access to it and they all can provide inputs into that capability so that when we buy that capability uh, through NRO, for example, with a defense contractor, let's say it's Lockheed Martin building a satellite or something like that, that all of their equities are addressed in that sensor system and all the capabilities they want that to do. So we brokered that kind of like, um, and I can speak on the SIGINT side, and then we also have biology and nuclear as wow. the other parts of NBC. Yeah. 
Valerie Plame is a name I haven't heard in a, quite a few years. It's funny you bring her up, and you refreshed my memory on a couple of FOIA cases that I had many, many years ago. Uh, but that's a different show in itself. So, so let me ask you, somebody who's involved in that type of work and weapon systems, and obviously you answered one of my other questions already, your lab was top secret SCI, so you were highly cleared at these levels. It's kind of obvious, but you know, just to set that up, how do you have a focus like that with the CIA and wind up at UFO conferences and you, you know, showed up at my, at one of, you know, my appearances, um, what's that bridge? What got you into the UFO side of this? Uh, was it anything official or personal? Well, first of all, let me preface. I don't remember we identified as CIA. I think because of the way we behaved, you might have surmised us to be CIA. I, you might be right. But to be honest with you, I could have, maybe I, I could absolutely be wrong. And maybe I picked up on it. But I remember being nervous, okay. meaning like, why are they in? And, and again, maybe it was just an assumption on my part. Um, so yeah, forgive me if I misremembered that part. Yeah, uh, we would not identify CIA. And uh, a sec to your uh, question. Um, we went there because we were personally interested in ufology. So my friend and I, uh, we were both experiencers and we both had sightings. And so we had an interest, but having that interest in CIA was not official. Both of us, we uh, informed CIA Office of Security, the fact that we're going to this conference, the hotels we're staying at, the flights we're taking, uh, and, and to verify that we're paying for everything, the flights, the hotels, and the conference fees out of, out of pocket. And as long as they know where we're at, uh, they didn't care where we went. Hmm. And it's within CONUS, so it's not like we're traveling overseas. Sure. Uh, so that makes it a lot easier. Uh, so it was a personal interest. And uh, many people at CIA who worked in other areas, not even uh, close to the weapons intelligence area I worked, but in other areas, we're also hobbyists, I would say, of the entire topic. And I know that because I was an administrator of a discussion database in Lotus Notes, which really dates the technology, IBM Lotus Notes, and they had little discussion database areas within Lotus Notes. And one of them is called the Users Group, T H U G. And we put a little s it's pronounced thugs yeah and all of a sudden uh, a lot of folks who served in my time will remember oh that's that john ramirez from thugs because i was one of the administrators and i used to contribute a lot into the computer hobbyists that used to uh, uh, post in that uh, particular uh, data discussion base mm -hmm. uh, but one of the topics was like what dni Abraham Haynes calls the other topic. Mm -hmm. And so we had a catch all of things that we just contributed. And that's where a lot of pe people talked about uh, the Anunnaki, uh, the monuments on Mars, uh, hmm. uh, anomalies on the Mar on Mars and the moon and, and things like that that were mostly speculative in nature. Um, I brought up the remote viewing program um, and uh, NK Ultra and all these things that we all know from FOIAs. Uh, that uh, CIA was involved in, uh, we just discussed it at that level. And it's supposed to be unclassified, so we're not going to put in anything in there of a current operation or current capability. Yeah, It's more historical looking back and personal, personal experiences. And so in that context, um, that's how uh, I was able to interface with that entire topic at an unofficial level. But having said that, I got phone calls on the secure line, the, what CIA officers would know, the green phone. So I say green phone, they know exactly what phone was ringing. Uh, the green phone rang and people would tell me about uh, certain things that they witnessed uh, in the course of their careers or even some in the course of their military careers. For example, uh, the strong association with Navy and the phenomena. So one uh, CIA officer called me up and said, yeah, when I was on the USS Boston um, and we we're uh, off the coast of Vietnam, uh, we had to fight off a UFO. My ship went to general quarters and we fought off a UFO. And uh, I looked at the deployment of that ship 
um, and where where uh, when that ship was off the coast of Vietnam, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin or uh, what they call Yankee Station, mm -hmm. uh, there was nothing there that would even hint at that occurring. I looked at the cruise uh, the cruise books, and Navy people know that when you go on like a cruise into the Pacific, the West Pax, or to the Med, the Med cruises, that there's a cruise book, a like a high school annual. And uh, I looked in there for any instance of anything strange occurring. Of course, that's not going to be in there. But yeah. he, he affirmed that, yeah, that happened. And so in that level, that's where I got involved with um, somewhat personal as well as semi-official. Let's talk about the semi-official. Um, were you able to pique anybody's interest internally with the CIA about these types of reports that you were getting through through the thugs, through the from the from the your fellow thugs? Uh, were you able to get people to be interested, or what happened with that? Well, I think they were like already interested, and I met some of them for lunch, um, and we talked about it like at lunch, going to the cafeteria, mm -hmm. um, and we could talk about it because it was personal like experiences, mm -hmm. um, there is no classified discussion at any cafeteria sure. in the intelligence community. It's unclassified. So we can't get into details about, you know, the professional side of what we might have worked on. Uh, but it's all personal uh, anecdotes of what we experience ourselves. So at that level, yes, I, I was able to like, have a group of people uh, just getting together at lunch uh, on our own time because mm -hmm. lunch is our own time mm -hmm. and not doing it, doing it this um, during government hours. The eight hours we're, we're working. Is that what you refer to as the semi-official aspect of it? Right. Uh, the semi-official came from those discussions plus what I got on the green phone. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, which is fascinating. Um, uh, and and I took notes about the USS Boston and and in Vietnam and the Gulf of Tonkin. But uh, are there any other incidents uh, that you received through the green phone or elsewhere that stick out to you as being something that is not very well known or known at all in the UFO field, but something that on an official level or excuse me from your time in the CIA uh, that you heard about uh, anything that sticks out to you? Well, I've already talked about this in, in my previous appear appearances about the uh, org working group. Uh, and, and I want to get into that. Yeah, yes. so w that's a perfect transition. So what exactly is this org working group? Well, um, let's say that before any huge program is launched, and a program is something that requires dollars and cents to fund it, requires a facility, requires contractor support, administrative support, logistics support, all of that, that that's real money. Uh, before that occurs, there's always like offline before that occurs, uh, pre-program people getting together to kind of bound the problem. Like what, what are we looking at? Uh, what are we dealing with? And how do we uh, approach this issue? So the org working group started when, and I can say this because the existence of orbs was officially disclosed in James Lekatsky's uh, Skinwalkers of the Pentagon book. But we, we did see orbs, much like what they saw uh, associated with a lot of the anecdotes uh, from eyewitnesses in that book. So we saw orbs. And these and orbs... If, if I can interject, and I don't mean to, John, just can you give a very brief definition? I know what an orb is, and, and I'm sure my oh, audience does. Other but audience in, in members? The, mm -hmm. Yeah, in the context of how you're referring to it, what, what is an orb? Okay, so uh, we have structural craft, uh, the nuts and bolts metallic craft that people have seen uh, throughout the history of ufology. And then we have what appears to be balls of energy, that's the best way I can describe it, that people have also seen. Those are the orbs I'm talking about. Okay. And so we said, well, people have seen these all along, but from officially, um, some of these orbs cannot be seen unless you look at a spectrum outside of light or actually below light, infrared, is being below light, below red. And when the, we have these capabilities built into some of our spacecraft and turn them on, 
we are looking for like uh, launch detection. That's its primary function. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also looking for what's known as change detection. Uh, we might be looking at a field that uh, might be used for narcotics production. And we want to know what changes may have occurred over a period of time over that field. And that gives us an idea of what might be going on. Uh, so that's that's the day job, if you will, of those sensors. Uh, what happened was outside of that day job of doing just normal intelligence collection, all of a sudden they saw these balls of light. And it wasn't like an anomaly uh, to the sense that what NASA explains as dust or, you know, particles or whatever yeah. NASA lens flare. It wasn't that. Um, and so it was something that was a tangible uh, phenomenon, but not that can't be explained. And so originally, you know, when you get something like that, you want to filter it out because it's noise based on like what you're really looking at. You don't want mm -hmm. any of the noise there. So you want to like get rid of it from the data, subtract it from the data because you just want to look at your target. Well, this kept appearing over and over. And it wasn't over the United States because we don't turn on these sensors over the United States. The national technical mean sensors are not collecting against the United States. It's an adversary. And so over adversary airspace and in space, uh, here comes these, these anomalies. And they kept happening to the point where, okay, now we got to pay attention to this. We got to pay more attention to this because this isn't something that is just a random occurrence. Uh, this is something that is almost like a uh, a tangible manifestation of something we don't understand. So let's get the working group together. And so, what year? What year was this going on? Uh, the the best I can say is if you look at Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. And you can now search for KH11. Mm -hmm. They give you all the blocks. Mm -hmm. Block one, block two, block three, block four, block five. Block two in the early 90s was when the KH11, a optical sensor taking pictures, also included an infrared payload. It, the KH11 is an electro-optical sensor. I can say that because NRO revealed that yeah. in the 60th anniversary brochure. So I'm safe yeah. saying it's, it has electro optical capabilities. Um, so around the best way I can tell you uh, without getting into trouble is look look at um, those blocks. And so the earliest would have been in the early 90s. But as these capabilities improved, uh, when I first heard about this phenomenon occurring, it was more in the time frame of when I became chief of ELINT about 2003, 2004. And the working group? 2000, sir. starting about 2004, 2005. Gotcha. So what's the next step once a working group convenes? And I, if, I, and I assume, but I want to clarify, that the working group would be an a, a official CIA working group. No, it wasn't. It was an official NGA working group. Uh, okay. NGA um, was the source of the data. And whoever has the source of the data, uh, they're in charge of a working group. So it was NGA. I see. Uh, okay. The National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. They, they are the ones who um, analyze optical and electro-optical imagery. I see. So it was their data. And so our tasking at the CIA side, we were weapons intelligence, non-proliferation arms control, the weapons intelligence part. Uh, the first thing we want to do is to rule out, is it advanced technology from an adversary? And since we look at advanced technology from our adversaries, uh, we can do that analysis. There are people looking at the actual craft that could potentially uh, be this, and we're looking at the sensors or packages like countermeasures, electronic countermeasures, uh, that could be providing this, this kind of orb like, uh, manifestation. And so what we looked at was, uh, platforms 
in the Russian inventory that could have some kind of capability like that. And plasma stealth is that type of capability. Whereas we built faceted kind of shaped uh, aircraft like the F-117 Nighthawk with facets and with uh, radar uh, observing materials. Uh, the Russians went the opposite way. They built devices that could be hung on to some of their aircraft and produce a plasma field. So, okay, that, that's Occam's razor. You know, that's the simplest explanation. Aha, uh -huh, that's what it is. But these orbs started appearing like way beyond the highest flying Russian aircraft, which is the MiG-31. Um, it, it flew higher than the Foxhound. And so 123,000 feet is its uh, maximum ceiling. It did like briefly in a test. It usually flies between like 85 to 100,000 in uh, what we call wartime mode. Mm -hmm. They don't fly that all the time, but if they need to, they can sustain some flight because it's basically designed to shoot down um, a uh, SR-71. It would look down the radar is capable of looking down the missile is capable of firing down we call it look down shoot down it had that capability for that purpose and if you're wondering why we don't fly sr-71s anymore why do we take them off the inventory that's the, one of the reasons as well as improvements in soviet air defense uh, russian air defenses so we rule that out completely and so other components of the intelligence community will bring their expertise to rule out their areas of expertise that they have knowledge of. And once that happens, subject matter experts in each intelligence agency will be called together and meet to share information that they have gathered to rule out everything. And then it was an opportunity for NGA and NRO. After they checked that it wasn't a software glitch and it wasn't a hardware glitch on the satellite, they brought their expertise in and at some point in that working group, they were informed about more of the history of the intelligence community and the US government's dealings with ufology uh, at a very deep classified level. I refused to be briefed into that. I, I didn't want to be briefed into that at all. I didn't need actually to know that, uh, but. I didn't need for them to share why they wanted two of my engineers to go to this working group. And so my job was to write performance appraisal reports. I just need to know what they're doing so I can evaluate what they're doing and account for their time and pay for their trips. So I've got like 12,000 questions that just popped in here in the last 90 seconds of what you were saying. So let me first start with the involvement with the field of ufology. Is there any type of elaboration you can offer on that? I know you said you weren't brief, so I got that. But I mean, are, do you know what they were referring to? Or are you talking about just their, their, in my opinion, uh, not really an investigative effort, but in, in essence, trying to skew the storyline during the Project Blue Book era? Are you, are you talking about that or something post Blue Book and something more sinister? Nothing sinister, but we're talking about the actual technical exploitation of the UFO craft that flew during the classic era, 50s, 60s, 70s, during that Project Blue Book time, um, the data that was collected that by the government. That's what we're talking about. And they got okay. briefed. I believe they got briefed into that. Data or physical objects slash craft? As far as I know, data. I don't know if they saw physical objects. I don't know if they saw anything about crash retrievals, metal materials. I don't know because I didn't have access to that kind of information. Really um, quickly, why did you turn it down with your with your background and personal interest? Was there a reason that you don't mind sharing? Well, basically, um, you know, this wasn't my day job. Uh, my day job was much more involved than just sending two engineers to this. And it, the thing about CIA is that we don't hire people with curiosity. You know, I mean, if you're you're going to get a job at CIA because you're curious about UFOs and you want to get a job there, you're not going to get a job there. Yeah, we I have specific missions 
to do. We have specific jobs to accomplish. And so that was my focus. And my plate was full with many, many other things, not to mention uh, a budget. Gotcha. Uh, so, you know, my life was like Excel was spreadsheets. Much. Gotcha. Excel spreadsheets was the was my job as a branch chief. That's all I looked at, it seems like. And uh, managing programs and leading people. Uh, the career service of these people was my responsibility that I make sure that they're challenged, that they're trained, um, that they're accomplishing the mission that we need to accomplish. Uh, that was my focus. Yeah. And so just this is just being like an interest of mine. Um, I knew what I needed to know to do my job. And that's all I needed to know. Gotcha. Uh, but I would say this, uh, when they came back, my two engineers came back, I used to have a little alien doll, a gray, except it was colored green yeah, and it was uh, like a stuffed stuffed doll that mm -hmm. I could bend and put it on my uh, old 17 inch Dell CRT monitor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Top of the line. Uh, yeah. Top of the line. And the, everyone knew I was interested in it uh, in, in UFOs and ETs. Right. And so when they came back, they didn't say anything. They just sounded like nodded to uh, my doll. And they basically say, you know, uh, everything you think about, uh, that doll uh, makes sense now. Wow. I said, okay, I, said, I don't need to know more. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't tell me anymore. So that's the closest I got to knowing what they what they knew. But um, so let me with with that being said, if that was the closest you got, let me take you back to the working group. And it sounds like you guys worked really hard on trying to figure out you know, is there a Soviet explanation for this? And and essentially ruled a lot of that out or all of that out. Was there a conclusion? I mean, what were you guys leaning towards at that point when the intelligence and the data showed you it was not the Soviets, it was not this MIG, it was not whatever you were looking at? What was the working um, theory? Yeah, I, I would preface that with uh, it was during the Russian era because um, in the uh, early 90s, the Soviet Union had... Gotcha. Owned, Sorry, owned I was Russian. going back a little too far. But. Um but I, I wasn't privy the to... The tech was probably the same. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't privy to any of the results of what the working group did. I, I did not know. I just know there was a working group. It, it dealt with this unusual orb anomaly. Um, I, uh, I knew that it uh, was in the 600 nanometer range, which is orange, which kind okay. of fits what people see themselves now, eyewitnesses, orange orbs, um, that they were... Uh, not just random specks, but they were uh, flying in some kind of grouping. I say formation, but when I say formation, people think of a you know V shape or something like that. It was just flying together, okay, at a very fast rate, coming over the uh, the Arctic Circle region, over the uh, Russian landmass, with intent to go somewhere. You know, it's not like they're just scattering everywhere. There's a whole group flying together as a group. And so, so that's that's what I knew. So you okay, so you found out about all of that, but but never no whomever shared with you this information, uh never said, John, this is what we think it is, or no. Uh, no. No, that that was a compartment. They they were read into a compartment that was created for that purpose, for the working group purpose. From what you did learn and your experience, uh, extensive experience with all of this uh, through 25 years, looking back, what do you feel? And, and I know it's an opinion and you're not sharing classified info here, but if I were to just ask you based on your personal opinion and your intelligence on the matter, what would you say? Well, I, I believe that these orbs are some manifestations of the phenomenon that is not metallic craft. It could be... Um, Okay, so for, with my uh, interest in more of the esoteric uh, features of ufology that is more like uh, what we call uh, the metaphysical side of ufology, uh, I believe that they're like manifestations of higher consciousness, that they're not like craft. They're not like, like Tic Tac or Gimbal or Go Fast. Mm-hmm. 
uh, but they're like manifestations of some other parts of the phenomenon that we don't quite fully understand. But when you talk to experiencers, they fully understand it. If you talk to people who have seen these orbs, uh, they fully understand what they're looking at, that there's some consciousness behind what they're seeing. Uh, to the point when I saw my orb uh, in 2020, um, I got a message from it to do what I'm doing right now, that you have information the world needs to know. You need to share this information. And you need to work with someone who's looking to, uh, to have answers to their questions. And I found that person. Um, so that's my interpretation. Who can I ask who is that? A, uh, no, I can't, I can't uh, reveal his name. Under, understood. I, I wasn't sure if there was a, maybe a public program, uh, a project that you were doing that you could no. share, but no mm -hmm. problem. It's private. Sorry. Yeah. Didn't mean to, didn't mean to pry too much there, but, um, so, so your experience obviously was kind of reminiscent to what the KH 11 and the NGA data that was being shared with the CIA and that working group. Yeah. Do you feel it was the same phenomena phenomenon? Well, um, the orb phenomenon was more of the electro optical variety IR. Um, previously that, um, the Soviet union, during the Soviet era, uh, with their radar systems, did detect uh, unusual events in the sky. And we call those the domes of light. Mm -hmm. So that's another type of a light kind of manifestation of the phenomenon. And I first heard about the domes of light, not through any kind of intelligence source, but a quasi intelligence source, the Aviation Week Journal which we used to call aviation leak, leak. Yep, because <laughs> there's so much good information in there that we actually circulated it around the office uh, for, and we put a, a, a routing slip on it to make sure we check our names off because there was so much information in there that actually triggered a lot of, of professional investigations into what they were reporting. And one of them was the domes of light, uh, which FTD knew about. And then they, uh, the FTD uh, wanted to cast this as a type of Soviet ballistic missile countermeasures that they were seeing. Uh, but these domes of light occurred absent of any missile test. Wow. And the missile that uh, was most prevalent with these domes of light uh, was the SS-20 Sable, which was an intercontinental uh, no intermediate range ballistic missile IRBM, uh, which was politically destabilizing and militarily destabilizing during the day because they would like station these uh, SS 20s close to NATO. And that was its purpose. The target was NATO. And that prompted us to then deploy the Pershing 2 IRBM. So you have nuclear missiles that can land on our targets within minutes because they're so close. Um, and that was highly politically destabilizing. And so the phenomenon, probably my opinion is the phenomenon knowing uh, that we know now that, that they're associated with like ballistic missiles, nuclear tip ballistic missiles, the phenomenon had an interest in the testing of the SS-20. And so when they launched SS-20, this phenomenon will occur, which was interpreted by FTD in the most mundane way, it's just ballistic missile countermeasures. But how do you describe this phenomenon being seen by uh, people on the ground mm -hmm. who are not associated with the Soviet military. There's just eyewitnesses, citizens on the ground seeing this. Um, so it's not like totally related to uh, ballistic missile testing. Uh, and that was detected by uh, radars, by the Russian radar, the Soviet radars at the time. So um, in that sense, uh, my very first encounter with anything of high strangeness was not these, this or working group, but this phenomenon known as the domes of light, wow. where um, we actually deployed sensors uh, to look for these unusual types of anomalous lights. And where we deployed that sensor uh, was on the periphery of the Soviet Union, because we wanted to get a good look at as the missiles were flying their trajectories and re-entering the warheads where we re-enter, we want to be able to detect if there are any of these domes of light. 
Let me ask you a hypothetical question, and this is more towards uh, the orb working group versus the domes of light. But let's let's say, and I know you don't know the conclusion, but that but they were leaning to a, some kind of manifestation of a phenomenon of some kind uh, that was not related to a missile launch or countermeasures or anything like that. Is that something that either the NGA would take the next step in trying to figure out? Or, in my opinion, for many, many years and arguably decades, uh, some of these intelligence agencies just kind of turned a blind eye to the more nuts and bolts UFO phenomenon. Uh, with this, do you think the CIA would have said, hey, we need to figure this out, we as the CIA? Or would the NGA do that? Or do you think that they would just say, you know what, um, we're going to leave this well enough alone? Like, who do you think would be taking the lead on trying to then take the next step to understand it? Well, as a working group, uh, the product of the working group will be a report mm -hmm. of their best estimate, assessment, or judgment of what we detected. And that report will go to the Director of National Intelligence. And the Director of National Intelligence can then brief the policymaker, that is the President of the United States. And the appointed policymakers, like the Secretary of Defense. And once that report is written, the Title 50 side, and for your audience, the Title 50 is the non-DOD side of the intelligence community. So it's basically CIA and actually parts of the NSA, which are non-military. Uh, they, they would then uh, just produce, the working group would produce the report from a Title 50 perspective of the civilian side of all of these intelligence agencies. And there's the report. Now, the Secretary of Defense being briefed on this, maybe USDI being briefed on this, um, it's up to them to s decide you know, what to do. And they may uh, then take the DOD perspective on just about everything like that. It's a threat, or it could be a threat. And if it is a threat or could be a threat, um, first of all, uh, how do we protect our own forces? What is the nature of this threat? what are our vulnerabilities versus this threat, and how do we do force protection? So that's their focus, and in comes all sat. So um, 2004, 2005, uh, when I left for NCPC and returned in 2009, that working group was done. My understanding was it was done like 2007 thereabouts. It was a short-lived working group. It wasn't like something that lasted years and years and years. Are you so, aware of, of that report? that um, they potentially, I know that that's a standard procedure that you're going over, but in direct relation to that orb working group, are you familiar that they created a report? Um, I can say that a report was a product of the working group. So there was and a report. So they, there was a report. I can okay. say that. So classified? You, is this a classified Oh, study? absolutely. It's going to be classified because uh, in that report, they will use sources and methods. They sure. would use exactly uh, what these sensors were able to detect. Classified it's, elements. I'm talking about the project or program or, excuse me, working group. I, I want to make sure I'm accurate here, but the working group as a whole, was it a classified effort oh, as a whole? Absolutely. It was a, t a top secret SCI working group with a compartment designed for that working group. Uh, and, and all that makes sense. Can I ask, just as, as, as myself being a layman and not entirely sure about all of uh, every facet of the classified world, how is it that you're able to talk about it? I know you didn't give conclusions uh, and you didn't talk about technical capabilities of you know top secret tech, mm -hmm. but if the idea of the, if the working group itself was a top secret SCI uh, environment, um, help me understand how can we talk about it? Well, John, there, there are levels of understanding. Mm -hmm. And the first level of understanding um, is called fact of. Fact of that something occurred. So the fact of is not sensitive mm -hmm. now. I mean, I learned of this way back when, and I sat on it until like this year, I, uh, you know, when I started doing these podcasts mm -hmm. and I put it together in a report for CIA's review that, you know, working group happened and this is what might've happened. 
Um, and I couched it in terms that um, could be a hypothetical, but CIA knew that this working group occurred. And and they, uh, just to clarify, because I've talked about the DOD side on this channel before, so my audience yeah. that's seen a lot of the videos, that would be the DOPSER process, the DD Form 1910, so on and so forth, that ties into the uh, UAP videos. So CIA, I assume, would just have the same similar process where you take what you are going to either publish, talk about uh, verbally, orally in a in a uh, uh, like a conference or or lecture, and they approve what you can come out with. Is that that's correct? Okay. Um, so it, and they gave you approval to talk about this, right? The pre-publication classification review board stated that my presentation was unclassified and can be publicly disseminated, everything in it. And that they do not, that the fact that they consider it unclassified, they do not say that they can endorse sure. everything in it, whether it be factual or not factual. So it's their, they're out the way, the way they can like distance themself, themselves uh, from anything we CIA officers might produce. Even gotcha. if it's factual, um, they will always say, well, we can't stay, say officially that is factual. So that was the situation that I follow. This is the front door situation. I just want to let everyone know I am not a whistleblower. Mm -hmm. um, I went through the front door and I will always go to the front door because that's what I signed up to do when I left CIA to protect sources and methods over a lifetime. And so that was the process I followed, which allows me to be speaking with you. And I let CIA know that if there's anything I say, and you know, th they're monitoring all of my appearances. Mm -hmm. They monitor Jim Semivan's appearances on Coast to Coast. Or any, uh, any appearances by former intelligence community officers, our home offices, <laughs> believe me, they're monitoring what yeah. we say. And they know, and because I told them, if there's anything I do or say that crosses a line, let me know and I will stop. Mm -hmm. And so far I've received no feedback about stopping. If you could sum up what your intention is by doing these types of shows and, and bringing this information forward, in summary, what are you wanting to accomplish? I want to accomplish that what we all know as, uf as ufologists, what you know it, is that the government even Project Blue Book was a limited program of gathering information from citizens. Gathering information from citizens, maybe to debunk or maybe to collect these other incidents in their database. But there was an ongoing process since Roswell to try to understand what we're seeing, what we have collected. That process never stopped. And this orb working group was just a latest part of that long ongoing process to where we're not seeing metallic craft. Now we're seeing these entities of light appearing over the earth. And so I want people to know that what you're knowing, what you've known as all SAP and ATEP, that wasn't when it started. Mm -hmm. Uh, we informed, I believe we informed the people who did all SAP and ATIP. They must have known about this working group because they were, there were uh, defense intelligence people associated with that working group of looking at orbs. So, so uh, it, and that's an interesting line. I mean, chrono chronologically, you're talking about, it sounds like a few years, roughly, you know, the, the, the concept of OSAP, depending upon who you believe was kind of born in 2007. Officially, it was, you know, towards the end of 2008, when it was contracted out. So you feel that that's there's a direct line there between, or maybe not direct, but there's a line or connection between the work of a orb working group like this, the discovery of that uh, phenomenon, and then the OSAP contract coming up, and the DIA's focus, you feel that there's some kind of line there, there's a lineage. Mm -hmm. There's a lineage. It's not a direct lineage, but when Title 50 got done, Title 10 took it up. Title 10 being the Department of Defense. And so many of the same people who are in the DIA and under Title 50, uh, 
under NSA, NRO. Um, they're also kind of under, uh, mostly under Title Title Ten. Um, they answer to the Secretary of Defense. Mm -hmm. They nod to the DNI. We answer to the DNI. We're Title Fifty, and people need to realize that the intelligence community isn't uh, this big monolith. Uh, there are different um, U.S. code laws that ma uh, that regulate what we can do. We have to follow these laws. We follow Title Fifty. DOD follows Title Ten, and so Lou said this himself. This was a Title Ten effort. Mm -hmm. And he always mentions this is a Title 10 effort because he knows that there was a Title 50 effort. <laughs> and so he just doesn't say uh, we're just DOD, the, the, the department did this. He says this is a Title 10 investigation mm -hmm. into what we saw. And they went into even more high strangeness with so Sam Walker. Yeah, exactly. And that, that leads me to my next question, because I've always been skeptical over what the official DIA desire for OSAP was versus what a contractor may have turned it into. Or was he just he meaning Bigelow, Robert Bigelow, but through Bigelow Aerospace when he was awarded this doing exactly what the DIA wanted? Or was it skewed a bit and ended up backfiring, hence why it was defunded? A couple years later, I've always struggled with that because DIA, as you mentioned, um, <clears throat> is the military side of this. They're getting into, uh, according to the story, the paranormal and looking at Skinwalker Ranch and uh, orbs go along with a long list of other stuff, uh, including, you know, weird creatures that they were investigating and so on. Uh, that also was in Skinwalkers in the Pentagon. And this is where my skepticism comes out. So maybe you can help me out here mm -hmm. understand why would that be in the purview of the DIA? I can see a couple other agencies. If you took the DIA out and put, you know, a couple other different agencies in, okay, then we, we, we could we can chat about that. But I don't see DIA. So from your experience and expertise from the IC side, why DIA? Why DIA is because the director of DIA is the functional mission manager for an intelligence dif discipline known as MAZIN, Measurement and Signature Intelligence. Uh, sometimes people say signals intelligence. That's not correct. It's man measurement and si uh, signature intelligence. So they would deploy sensors that can collect uh, this, type, this type of phenomenon. They would collect uh, radiometric data, radiological data, um, infrared data, ultraviolet data. They, they will look at this phenomenon with the sensor capabilities that they can deploy that doesn't just collect signals like NSA or in CIA. Uh, there's really no human involved mm -hmm. because there's no one to recruit as an, as an agent to work for us. <laughs> We're not going to recruit the phenomenon. Hey, why don't you work for us and tell us what, what you're doing? So this, the, those parts of the intelligence community would not come into play. But the DIA is responsible for MASINT. There is a part of the DIA called DIA slash Delta Tango, DT, and that is the MASINT office at DIA. And so they have the complete responsibility for MASINT. And since this phenomenon is something that requires collection beyond our senses, beyond our other types of um, capabilities and signals or human or open source, DIA will come into play. And that's why they're there. It's on not US just- soil, But on US soil, DIA. They can do that because Department of Defense, they're responsible for the national security of the United States of America in that very tangible form. So DIA as Department of Defense Title 10 can operate on uh, US soil for the intelligence mission. They can deploy in that sense. CIA cannot deploy to collect intelligence on US soil. Now, if this phenomenon occurred in Russia or China or some other foreign place, that's when CIA can CIA come in. CIA could, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And 
some of this controversy, and I just want to get your input and then we can move on. Uh, some of the controversy about this is what the public OSAP uh, objective list was. And that, that was public for many years, um, just even prior to December of 2017, even though we never knew about OSAP uh, until the next year. But um, that was public for quite some time. Zero mention about any of that. It, you worked in the top secret world. If they wanted a paranormal research study that they would keep highly classified, why would they post anything in public? Why wouldn't they either do it themselves or contract in secret? Um, it, it, it is, it, do you have thoughts on, on that? Because I've, I've always been curious about what was publicly available versus what we've been told the program really was. Well, um, first of all, when they hired Bass, uh, that had to be a, uh, a detail known to the public through the RFP process. Mm -hmm. um, you can't just pick a company and say, work for us. They had to go and follow the federal acquisition regulations mm -hmm. on how to hire an external contractor. And they did that. Um, so in the federal register, um, you have to announce the fact that there is a contract and you have to publish the request for proposal in the public mm -hmm. domain. So the requirements for such a capability um, for this contract and the requirements for um, uh, the mission and what it needs to um, accomplish uh, it would have to be publicly known because how mm -hmm. else can a company then uh, leverage its resources and its capabilities? Um, how, how can they do that unless they know what the government wants? So the well, RFP, but well, there's classified contracts that are awarded too, and you don't. And again, I'm I'm, I'm more asking, not telling you, uh, but but asking, you know, when you have a contract like for a stealth drone or something like that, that and correct me if I'm wrong, they don't put a an RFP out for that type of a uh, level of secrecy with the technology they want to create or do they well when okay so when like for example when this, when the f-117 was being developed uh that would be just as part of another uh, effort to advance uh aviation military aviation right but kept in, se in secret is where i'm going with um, that is well, once the program starts, it will be classified. Mm -hmm. But um, we don't announce um, all the details, the secret details of a program. We announce just enough to get to be able to do the market survey and to do the technical evaluation of the uh, responses coming back from these companies. And uh, they can be classified. Um, and, and but I, the actual letting of the contract, uh, the the RFP process mm -hmm. is not. But to your point, yeah, once once the uh, RFPs come back, um, they can be classified. Coming so back. Though, and and I'm I'm always fascinated by this and how it works because I I've tried to figure it out. So I'm I'm glad that I have you on just simply to be able to ask you this. But when you get into like the F117, I think that was Senior Trend was the was the. Uh, classified program name obviously they're not going to publish senior trend but there was an rfp for a program like that that ultimately turned into senior trend in the f-117 well there was there was also half blue is yeah the half name. blue there's taste mm -hmm. of blue right yeah senior um, spark right senior spark i think was a cia one but the, the i have to look back yeah well if if you look at um remove the labels and the intent of that development was to study uh, radar observing materials and not associated with the craft or um, just giving you an example. Um, if we're going to do something, we're not going to say we're doing it for this purpose because we have this mission and we want to target this adversary. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll look step back and say, what technical capabilities are we looking for? And we'll publish what we're looking for in technical capabilities and not link that to a specific program until we hire the contractor with those tech technical capabilities. Once a contractor has been hired, once they go through the whole process 
of acquisition and they're awarded the contract, then we make sure that they have the cleared people because we stipulate in RFP what the clearance level should be. Um, and then if they have cleared people, we can then introduce these contractors to the program. So we don't have an RFP for programs necessarily. We have RFPs to gather uh, information on what companies can do a capability. Um, that's the best way I can explain it because I used to write RFPs for CIA. Mm -hmm. And so we're not saying that, you know, we want to, we want to study um, this particular target in the Soviet Union. We we'll say, well, what capabilities are needed to bring to bear by this company in order to do that mission? Mm -hmm. So do you have engin electrical engineers with uh, microwave backgrounds? Do you have, you know, things like yeah. that? Do you have physicists? Do you have things like that. So do you have these people that have that background and this in this broader field? And we pick a company that answers all that. And then when we award the contract, we bring them to CIA and then you say, okay, this is the program you're working on. And there's cl the classified party. aspects. So j just to kind of button that, and I want to move on uh, to the, the present day stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so the potential contractor who sees the requirements in, in the public realm, uh, they're not aware of the, the classified aspects while they apply, right? I mean, they're not fed e e be prior to being accepted as the contractor. They're not fed what the classified aspects are, or are they? Uh, so, so they go off of the public stuff. You need, you know, this type of expert, this type of expert, this type of facility, this type of clearance, but they're not uh, fed the non-public classified portion of that contract until they are chosen. Specific targets. Um, we're not going to put that in an RFP. Um, we're not going to put uh, specific, specific um, tools that we have mm -hmm. that then we, it's called government furnished equipment, GFE. We're not going to publish that. We just say, yeah, there's GFE available which gotcha. includes the contractor saying, okay, they're going to give me information or give me tools that they're not stipulating, uh, things of that nature. So you're right in the sense that uh, we're not going to publish the target gotcha. in a RFP. Uh, I would also say that CIA does not need to publish any of its RFPs. There's a cut a, a carve out for CIA that we are not required as part of the federal acquisition regulations to actually let out RFPs in the federal register in the public. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I think that answered my question where I was going that with that uh, attributing it to OSAP is something I've talked about for quite a few years on if the paranormal and, and uh, UFO aspect was classified, which I could buy and it wouldn't be in the public announcement, which we've established is true. How would Bigelow know to to hit the jackpot by uh, looking for a secret UFO program to take part of without knowing it was a UFO secret program and he was the only bidder? And I'm not trying to put you in a weird corner, so if you don't yeah. want to comment on it, not so, a problem. I think that was where I was going with it because I've never had somebody in your position to give me that side of it. You wrote the RFPs and stuff like that, so that's why I wanted to ask right. you. Uh, but do you see where I'm going with that? I, I that... do. I do see where you're going. Um, I can't answer for Bass or Robert Bigelow specifically because I wasn't part of that acquisition. But I can give you the general case mm -hmm. um, that uh, it's not a secret that there there is a core of contractors who work with the Defense Department and work with the intelligence community and CIA. There's just a core of contractor companies that we go to all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like this close knit group of competitors. And so uh, with Bigelow, I mean, he's done previous work mm -hmm. at Skinwalker. So he has a lot of knowledge from the previous work at Skinwalker. So he has a leg up on anything that might come out as an RFP. Uh, my understanding is that Lockheed Martin was interested in the RFP, but dropped it. 
Yeah, there was a rumor. It was reported that they actually uh, uh, submitted a proposal, and then that was never officially retracted, but found out not to be true uh, when I had spoken to the DIA, and mm -hmm. they said sole bidder. I mean, I triple checked that and pressed them and said, "Hey, well, wait a minute, you know." And I think I even brought up Lockheed uh, at the time, but yeah, it was. Um, they may have been interested, but uh, I think uh, a lot of companies like Lockheed Martin. They hire people to do nothing but contract work. Yeah. They hire armies of people who know how to write RFPs. Yeah. And I mean, these RFPs are so specific that I used to eliminate. We used to put in language to see how compliant a contractor would be by <laughs> stipulating the type of paper, the weight of the paper, no uh, the font, uh, the font uh, used, and the font size. And we put in every third page shall be pink. Uh, we make sure that every third page is pink. Because if the third page is white, we say you're not compliant. Tossed. I mean, wow. that's how specific we can be. And so these people who know how to write this understand the rules of the game. Look for the fine print. Look for the fine print because they will answer um, that RFP that's, specifically. And that's so as your uh, specific question about Bigelow, understanding that I wasn't part of the acquisition. Sure. Um, he's queued in to the yeah. intelligence community. We all know that. And uh, he may have got wind that such an effort was going to start, and he had an RFP to go ready, ready. To yeah, shoot it was it. only up for a couple of weeks, and he was the only bidder. And yeah, I, and and again, you know, a lot of people make a big deal that I bring up the sweetheart deal thing. For me, it puts it into perspective of what OSAP was. Um, but but again, those are entire shows in itself, and I appreciate you entertaining those questions and yeah. and helping me understand some of that. Um, I'm I'm at the hour mark with you, and I don't want to take you um, uh, take up your entire day with this. So so let me kind of fast forward from the OSAP days. That regardless of what was official or not, here we are in 2022. Uh, last year, June, the UAP report was published to the public, big letdown to many people. Um, I found some gems in it, but obviously there was a, a big letdown. There are two observations uh, that I had. I, I was surprised at so many agencies taking part, and I put air quotes because we don't know how much part some of these took, in the report. There's about 13 or 14 you know, named here. Uh, I've got it on my screen. The second observation I want to bring up to you is the CIA is absent. So just looking at this sheet, there's the Army, the Navy, the Air Force. So obviously the, the obvious ones. But the NSA, the NGA, the NRO, the FBI, the DIA, NOAA, FAA, NGA, uh, NGA was duplicated twice in the report, um, and so on, ODNI. So there's quite a few different offices and, and agencies that took part, but not the CIA. What are your thoughts about this public report and specifically the lack of any CIA involvement, at least from what we're told? Well, um, the department knew that the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence had queued up language for the Intelligence Authorization Act, FY21, about this uh, UAP study. So the department knew that ahead of time. And in order to get ahead of the narrative, uh, the department announced that uh, from its understanding in June, when the IAA language became public, uh, the department got ahead of the narrative and said, well, we're not going to wait for this IAA to be signed because then Congress will drive us. Congress will be in charge. We're going to get ahead of the narrative mm -hmm. and create this UAP task force and announce it and put the Navy in charge. And so then we can then stipulate what the scope of this investigation is going to be, not Congress. And so that's what happened, uh, in my opinion. Now, you might talk to other uh, analysts who may disagree with that, but I've seen that happen before, where the government will get ahead of the narrative by saying, oh, we'll do it. We'll do it. Don't, don't legislate it. You can put the language in the legislation, but don't worry, you'll, you'll get what you need. So that's what the department did, I believe. Uh, to get ahead of the narrative. So if you look at the announcement in August, and you look at the report release in late June, uh, they had more than 180 days to do this. 
uh, they had a better part of a, a full year to do this yeah. because they wanted to control the narrative. Um, and so I believe that's what happened. It looks now, like they only took like three hours to put it together, though. <laughs> uh, let me I'll address that. Uh, CIA was not involved because this effort was Department of Defense Title 10. CIA is not part of Title 10. The Secretary of Defense cannot order the CIA to do anything or participate in anything. If anything, it's going to be a request to the director of CIA, you know, we invite you to re this, to this report. They did not do that because the department wanted to limit the scope of the report to just what was publicly released in 2017. That is uh, November, I think it was 12, uh, 27, uh, 2004, uh, the first Tic Tac and the Nimitz battle group. Mm -hmm. That's the start. And we're going to end it like sometime in, in 2021 yeah you know, that that's it that, that's the scope of the report we don't want cia to bring in its historical knowledge of everything that happened since roswell that's not going to be part of the report we want to just it be military so you think military it was strategic science. to not include cia not just because it was a limitation of SecDef and his you know mandate because i mean the faa is in there SecDef doesn't have any you know exactly uh, that's sure. a good point because you know if they added cia well cia wasn't invited and cia had no way of legally inserting itself into the report it was secretary of defense title 10. so can i ask do you know for a hundred percent fact that they weren't invited they were not invited they were and not you're, invited. You're and, and i'm only asking because i don't know but so so you don't think there was a any type of request and it was the cia that said hey no i don't we're not SecDef got no jurisdiction over us so we're not going to contribute so you know for a fact that there was never a line extended to cia i can't reveal why i know that but okay i do Fair know enough. that um they they were not formally invited to participate in the navy uap task force at all now, what about the the new effort the aoi msg um uaptf is going away aoi msg is coming aboard do you feel that there will be coordination there or do you think cia is still going to be the law states that there needs to be coordination between the secretary of defense in coordination with the director of national intelligence and so that's a, a way for cia to participate in aoi msg and also, um, there is the Intelligence Authorization Act, F FY22, where I'm not sure where that went, but there was language in there that was somewhat different. Uh, the NDA tends to say, okay, Secretary of Defense, you need to have the coordination of the DNI to do this group, AOI MSG. Um, but in the IAA, it tells the DNI, okay, uh, uh, Avril Haines, you need to get the uh, cooperation of the Department of Defense, the Secretary of Defense, to do this legislation stipulated program. So on the, on the uh, NDA side, it's a 180-day interval report. On the IAA side, it's a 90-day interval report so it's like two different pieces of legislation and i don't know if the ia language for uaps is still in there it's much shorter the nda is much broader uh, much in depth and uh so i'm not sure what happened to it but there's two pieces of legislation and i don't know how they're going to resolve who's in charge because on the senate side iaa it's the dni getting the cooperation secretary of defense on the NDAA side, which came out of the House Armed Services Committee, it is then the, or, yeah, I think I'm right. Um, it, the, it's the co it's the cooperation of the DNI underneath the Secretary of Defense. Yeah, I'm glad so it's, it's like, not confusing at all, John, because, yeah. you know. Well, I mean, I, I'm upset at the AOI, the MSG part. Yeah. Because that's, <laughs> management synchronization, to yeah. me, implies, okay, department, Let's get our story straight of what we tell Congress. Uh, why is it called management synchronization? 
yeah. management synchronizing what? <laughs> yeah. You know, object, uh, uh, airborne object and identification, that sounds great. But when you manage the identification and synchronize the identification according to what the department wants, that t tends to uh, tell me that it, we're not going to get a lot of what we really want. You know, I, I'm at the tail end of the time that I have with you, and, and I really appreciate your time. Um, if I can just ask you one one last question with your time in the, in the CIA, and and it sounds like you, you've had a lot of knowledge over the years that now you're being able to to come out with. Do you have any regrets over the last, uh, you know, 25 years with your career of the CIA or, or um, you know, even post-retirement, anything that you look back and wanted to do different with your time? Well, knowing that the Orb Working Group started in uh, around late 2004 and went through 2005 while I was chief of the ELINT analysis branch, uh, my regret was not hiring Eric W. Davis when he applied for a job at CIA. And that was my deepest regret, knowing uh, what his capabilities are and knowing his participation in the study of this phenomenon. I wish I would have hired him because I would have sent him to the working group. So Dr. Eric Davis had applied for the CIA in your in the ELINT, the, the make sure I have it, electronic intelligence analysis branch. You he actually applied for a broader job, job category known as STW, that's scientific, uh, technical and weapons. And so that is usually the place where um, scientists, physicists, uh, chemists, biologists, you name it, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, that's the job category that they would check off when they apply for a job. So he was STW. And so his resume uh, and his application package uh, went to hiring advisors in the Weapons Intelligence Non-Proliferation and Arms Control Center, my parent office. So it's logical that it went to, knowing the structure of WINPAC, it would have gone to the Missile and Space Group, and particularly in the Space Group because of his background. And it also perhaps in the Missile Group, Missile part of the MSG. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe he had interviews because I learned about his application from uh, my colleague, branch chief, who was chief of uh, Mazent in CIA. And he interviewed Eric W. Davis after he came downstairs and escorted downstairs to this signature uh, branch. And he was interviewed there. Have you, I'm just curious, have you talked about that before? Uh, Publicly? No. No, but if you ask me, like, what's my deepest regret? I re deeply regret that because he, he would have just been a be fascinating individual to talk to. And because I looked at his, uh, it's more than a resume. It was more like a CV. I mean, he listed a lot of detail in his in his CV. And knowing his background, um, I wish I would have hired him uh, in hindsight, knowing that there was an ORP working group starting up. Yeah. Um, but uh, the uh, signature... Uh, branch chief, signatures branch chief, um, handed me his application package for me to review. And um, I noticed that, you know, this is a brilliant guy. I mean, no doubt about it. He is brilliant mm -hmm. beyond belief. I mean, outstanding guy. And I looked at the projects he worked for, for the Air Force Research Lab. I read his paper, uh, CIA um, has a requirement to submit writing samples particularly in the director of intelligence, which is all about writing. Yeah. Um, and he submitted his paper on uh, teleportation physics, which I read. Uh, and it was uh, dated 2004. And I remember, oh, this is a recent paper because it was the same calendar year later mm -hmm. after he published that paper for AF, uh, AFRL. Um, but he, he was in the building unescorted, uh, escorted. He had to have an escort. Mm -hmm. And that means that he did not have a top secret SCI clearance that he passed to us. He didn't pass clearances to us to get a different kind of badge instead of a visitor's badge that required an escort at okay. all times, even going to the bathroom. Uh, he, he, uh, uh, that's the badge he had and he did not have the no escort required badge. 
which means that you passed your clearances at the SCI level. Do you remember what year this was, if I may ask? 2004, because when I looked at his paper, uh, Teleportation Physics, I remarked, oh, this is a very recent paper. He just he just published it. So that AFR, means he didn't have AFR, any clearance or didn't have a top secret clearance? He didn't have a top secret SCI clearance when top he okay. uh, and, went into CIA for those interviews. I, I I have to, if you don't mind, can I take you for a couple more minutes? Are you okay? Sure, to, go ahead. Uh, so with that, the two questions I have, and one you may not be able to answer, but very quickly, was he hired by, I know you said you didn't hire him, but did somebody else at CIA? Uh, my part of WIMPAC did not hire him. The signature branch, the ELINT branch, we didn't hire him. And he wasn't, I did not see him in WIMPAC spaces, in the places that I should see him at, the Missile and Space Group, part gotcha. of WIMPAC. He so, wasn't in there. So, so not to say that somebody might have seen his his application package and may say, hey, this is a great guy that we can consult with. So bring with. him over here. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, we but, can but you guys did. Guy. But we um, we didn't we didn't hire him as a blue badge employee. Not to say that he may have uh, he may have attracted enough interest uh, to be introduced to other people in the IC, saying, "Hey, this guy, you know, he's very interesting." We didn't hire him as a blue badge staffer, but you might be interested in him. Um, in, I don't know if he served as a consultative capacity at all as an independent contractor. I don't I don't have that knowledge. I do know he was escorted because my engineer uh, escorted him. Uh, down the hall to a snack stand and CIA officers were no, it's Ron and Sally's snack stand on the ground floor where <laughs> my branch was located. Yeah. Ron and Sally, um, Ron was blind and he was very affectionately liked by all CIA officers who served during when they had a snack stand. So that validates, okay. <laughs> yeah. Ron and Sally's snack stand, my, uh, my engineer that I did send to the orb working group, one of them uh, was escorting him and he was introduced to a colleague of mine and another branch who I witnessed the fact that, oh yeah, he just had a visitor's badge. Wow. So this was 2004, you said, and, yeah. and the, I always like to put everything in chronological order because that's the best way to put together a puzzle. But I, I, you're familiar with the Eric Davis, Thomas Wilson notes, whatever we yeah. want to call them. Uh, I've done quite a few different videos on it. I'm a huge skeptic when it comes to these notes. Um, but since you have this kind of knowledge around the time frame, it was uh, allegedly October of 2002 when Eric Davis met with allegedly Admiral Thomas Wilson and Wilson as a J2 decided to spill all these, you know, highly classified secrets um, in Las Vegas. Based on what you've seen, do you have an opinion on those notes? And if he's not cleared, why would Wilson um, then I really want to ask the question, why would Wilson do that? Well, um, Eric Davis was a member of uh, an organization I'm a member of, the Association of Former Intelligence Officers. And you don't have to be an intelligence officer to be a member of the AFIO. Uh, you just have to be um, um, a person who um, has worked with intelligence or worked with the military intelligence side. And so he knew people who were in the Las Vegas chapter because he was a member. And the Las Vegas chapter members uh, vouched for Eric Davis to Admiral Wilson. So that was one of the ways that Admiral Wilson knew that Eric Davis was a real deal in terms of you know the fact that he is associated in some way with the intelligence community or with military. According to the story, or you have knowledge of that? Uh, he's a member of the AFIO. No, uh, yeah, no, no, I understand yeah. that. I'm talking about the vouching to Admiral Wilson is is that a story you've heard or you have direct knowledge that no that that's happened? that's based on a uh, good point that you have john that was based on uh reading the notes uh, oh okay was, I, I got gotcha. you so so we're going off you gotcha yeah. um the other thing that i have knowledge of is that um e e and g is the uh we call the operations operations and maintenance contractor for area 51. Uh, they run the security they provide all of the services just the logistical support of running that facility um, and it may provide some analytic support as well um, that's interesting that it went to e and g um, when i was uh, at a facility next to area 51 i went to the doe uh, facility to get badged 
Mm -hmm. So uh, I was surprised that it occurred at EEG's parking lot, according to the notes. Uh, I didn't know why that would be, but maybe Admiral Wilson had some business there to do. Do you feel uh, it happened, just out of curiosity, based on? Uh, well, uh, as you know, I say uh, embrace widely, hold lightly. Mm -hmm. And since I don't have any firsthand knowledge, um, I hold that lightly, but I embrace it widely that it's possible that could have occurred. What I don't believe occurred was Admiral Wilson saw that memorandum allegedly from the NRO and said, by golly, I need to get to the bottom of this. That is complete nonsense. I did a pretty big breakdown of that the, that memo and and how that anchored the, the, the whole story. And that, that to me is one of the biggest tells, in my opinion, again, this is just my opinion, on why there's <clears throat> not a whole lot of truth to this because the entire story hinges on that memo. And in my opinion, the memo's bunk. Uh, you brought up the memo, if you're familiar with it, do you feel that the memo's bunk? Yeah, it is completely bunk. So you so you agree that that memo is just that trash. wasn't the that wasn't the impetus for Admiral Wilson to uh, talk. But, to but according to the notes, it was, and according to Greer, it was because there was, um, yeah. Uh, I mean uh, that that's the legend anyway. Mm -hmm. That's that's the story. Uh, so for me, it falls apart from there. But again, going back to what you feel, I mean, do, do you feel there's any truth to that story? Um, I would give some possibility that uh, Eric Davis uh, was known to Admiral Wilson in some capacity. Uh, that's me being very generous. Mm -hmm. I don't think they were like 100% complete strangers. Um, I don't think uh, Admiral Wilson would look at Eric, Eric Davis and say, who is this guy? Because Eric Davis worked closely with the Air Force Research Lab. And so I would imagine that someone in the capacity of a J-2, the Joint Chief of Staff, would know about um, with the work of the AFRL. And so in that capacity, there might be some linkage there. But to say that uh, Admiral Wilson uh, wanted to speak with Eric Davis because he saw this memorandum, uh, Admiral Wilson would look at that and know it was completely faked. Yeah. I was Elant. And it listed Elant, what is it, Elant Ops? There's yeah. no such thing as Elant Ops. I was Elant. I know people at NSA Elant. I know the Elant community throughout the military uh, military intelligence side and the uh, civilian IC side. There's no such thing as Elant Ops or you know all these other ops yeah. that they put as addressees. And the format was completely wrong. Um, the Central Security Service is the uniform cryptologic service elements at NSA. They're the people wearing uniforms, members of the military who work at NSA in the SIGINT field. Uh, NRO, NRO's uh, uh, organization chart would not have Central Security Services there. Yeah. And NRO is not part of the Air Force, folks. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of problems. Not. I mean, so there are a lot of problems. And plus, all of the units they listed down, um, I have a list of where every unit was stationed. And, you know, I find it strange that one of the uh, wings, fighter wings, was stationed in Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma. And so <laughs> why would, you know, this the entire intent was of the memo was, oh, you know, we found out that uh, these UFO researchers are going to be at the uh, Little Alien Inn in Rachel, mm -hmm. Nevada, and we want to shut down all operations, right? And they listed like some of these units in the Air Force, they're, they're real units. Somebody did their homework, mm -hmm. but they just pick and chose, uh, pick and choose like cafeteria style. Oh, what sounds good? You know, uh, what what can we find that may have had some um, associated with Area 51? Just throw it in the report. So, I mean, I have a lot of problems with that. Mission Operations, MOC, by the way, stands for Mission Operations Center. That's what it stands for. Mm -hmm. And a note like that, it was legitimate, would not go to the MOCs of these organizations uh, or these fighter wings. Uh, every every uh, unit uh, involved in, in, in intelligence would have a SSO. Every Pentagon unit, every Department of Defense unit would have an SSO, a special security office, and that's the recipient. And for the top part, it wouldn't go to ELINT, MO, uh, ELINT Ops. Yeah. It would have said NSA S2. SSO. Yeah, it was 
It was definitely a mess. Uh, let me, the final question, bottom line, real quick, uh, beyond the memo, because yeah, then the yeah. biggest supporters of this uh, story have kind of dismissed my critique of the memo saying, oh, well, the, the memo's not a big deal n anymore to the story, even though it's been bantered about since day one. But now we take that out and it's like, oh, well, it's, it's not a big deal. So let's take the memo out of the equation. You look at the notes, you look at the idea and concept that Wilson would would spill these secrets. I know you said that it's a possibility that he would know him and or know of him. Right. With your experience being top secret SCI cleared, working for the CIA, and and again, this bio is amazing, so it kind of speaks for itself. With your intelligence background and clearances, do you see that happening with a J2? With a J2 at his position in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, the possibility that he may not be aware of the programmatic details, uh, I find that to be credible. But he would know the fact of mm -hmm. that there might be an effort uh, to reverse engineer some of these craft. So that's one level. But to know where it's being done, mm -hmm. uh, to know how much money is being placed in these programs, to know um, like results of these programs, to actually go to the, these, these facilities and see these craft, um, that could go either way, depending on how sensitive that program really is. And what I can bring from personal experience that I was involved in a controlled access program at CIA. And I had the bigot list for that program. And as the program was winding down, um, I was given the bigot list and I was made the uh, control officer for the program, a job that I did not relish and I got rid of as fast as I could. Um, but I was given a bigot list and on the bigot list were the uh, names, birth dates and social security numbers of the current president and former presidents. So I know that, you know, that bigot list is everything. Mm -hmm. And but you know why I didn't see this program was something that James Lakatsky would have interest in because it was part of his job to look at ballistic missiles and ballistic mm -hmm. missile defense. So we were collecting at a covert facility this data, and I did not see any very many DIA people on it. In fact, mm -hmm. the DIA people would have been at Missile and Space Intelligence Center in Huntsville, Alabama, and they were not on it. In fact, uh, NASIC, Air, uh, National Air and Space Intelligence Center, they were not on it. Mm -hmm. It was just CIA, State Department, because we needed entry into that country. And uh, the president, uh, National Security Advisor, um, Secretary of Defense was on it, Secretary of State at that level. But I didn't see like Joint Chiefs of Staff. I saw Secretary of the Air Force, but I didn't see Secretary of the Navy. And the oh. former presidents, I assume, was the they were being read through the presidential daily briefs, which they still get after uh, leaving office. Well, that program. Uh, I oh, after they leave office. Yeah, you were saying former. Were you referencing present at the time, but former right yeah, now? Yeah, I gotcha. Big, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. the bigot list included everyone who was ever read into the program. Gotcha. Okay. So you know, I saw Secretary of State current, Secretary of State former. Anybody was read into the program. It was I a see. short, big list. My name was on it. Gotcha. Um, with my social security and birthday. Um, what What was the program name, John? Uh, I can say this now because it didn't get redacted. Oh, good. Uh, I can't say the program name, but uh, the Central Intelligence Agency and the People's Liberation Army of the People's Republic of China had an intelligence sharing or, uh, agreement to the point where the CIA built a uh, second collection facilities in China and train Chinese officers on how to operate our equipment uh, to collect against uh, Soviet and then later Russian ballistic missile tests. So we were sitting side by side with our counterparts in Chinese intelligence. We uh, provided them with a lot of intelligence that you as an American citizen now can't see. But there are folks in China, <laughs> our Erzwell adversary, that saw this intelligence where we couldn't even share it with our own American people. Yeah. Uh, so that's 
that's how like some of these programs get so deep that very few people can be apprised of it. Um, and even people who would have an equity in analyzing that data were never given that data. NSA had it, NSA was apprised of it because they are the uh, SIGINT mich mission manager. And the functional mission manager for SIGINT is director of NSA, Dernza. So NSA was read into it. And, and when I went out there to travel uh, to uh, be chief of operations at one of the sites that we built, uh, my counterpart was NSA. But he didn't go as NSA. He went as CIA. He had to leave CIA, uh, NSA, temporarily and get badged. You're now in a CIA. Mm -hmm. Go out there, do your thing, and then come back, and then we'll make you NSA again. Those mm -hmm. are the kind of, like, I uh, can't share too many operational details, but those are the kind of things that we have to do. Because, mm -hmm. um, But I, I didn't see a lot of DIA people on it. So uh, using that as an extension, um, it's conceivable that a program, they may have fact of knowledge that we're exploiting uh, these uh, vehicles, alien reproduction vehicles, or whatever you want to call them. The fact of is one thing, but knowledge of the programmatics, the funding, the logistics, um, that's another whole another level. And in our program, we use trees. So if you are briefed on a certain tree, uh, you know so much. And if you brief on another tree, you know so much more. Mm -hmm. And we had a whole bunch of trees. So, you know, if, if, if you, oh, uh, you're briefed at the elm level, the elm mm -hmm. tree level, oh, you know this much. Mm -hmm. I need to brief you at the oak tree level, you know? I yeah. mean, <laughs> it's, that's the kind of thing, you know? So, um, so that was not redacted at all. Uh, and wow. I was surprised that CIA let me uh, say that we had an intelligence relationship with the People's Republic of China. Yeah, People's I Liberation uh, Army was not expecting that when you started talking about that. So I'm surprised. Um, John, I could talk to you all day. I hope that you enjoyed your experience here and, uh, and, and uh, really do appreciate on behalf of my audience, your time just coming aboard and fielding all these questions and letting me pick your brain here for the last uh, 90 minutes or so. So thank you for that. And I hope you'll come back because uh, it sounds like we would have quite a few more things to talk about. Uh, thank you, John. Um, and you actually, you helped uh, us uh, kind of close the loop on on our very first meeting together. And I, I think that's one of the charming stories of uh, my time at CIA is that I, I actually met you. And now I'm meeting you and providing uh, and sharing uh, some of my experiences at CIA when I couldn't do that when I first met you. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, appear again with you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that. And thank you all for listening and watching. Make sure if you are on YouTube, just go ahead and click that thumbs up button. Uh, it really does help the channel a lot. And make sure you're subscribed to the channel as well. If you're listening on the audio podcast platforms, or if you're not aware, these types of interviews get forwarded to every platform, including Spotify, iTunes, wherever your podcast aggregator of choices, make sure you look under the Black Vault Radio. I shoot for five stars, but reviews very much help. I won't tell you what to put, but again, that five-star mark is what we shoot for. Thank you again, John. Thank you all for listening and watching. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we'll see you next time.